welcome all. I mean, I think it's worth noting that we have had progress since last year. I think SAF production was up around 200%. That said, it still remains around 0.1% of all jet fuel, so we've got some way to go. Uh, and the challenges do seem huge. Pretty, let's start with you, and we'll, we'll start really with SAF production and feedstocks, which is perhaps at the heart of the issue. We're gonna move on to policy and investment as we go through the discussion. But clearly, all SAF is not made equal. You have different technologies, different feedstocks, and depending on that, the emissions reduction factor changes hugely. So walk us through it. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I think thanks for having me. Thanks to the organizers to have me from Lanzatec representing in this panel. Uh, to answer your question, I think it's a, it's a very complex, at the same time, simple way to look at it. When we talk about SAF, there are different feedstocks and different technologies. But if we step back and look at the overarching framework to produce SAF, one of the most important factor in the production of SAF is the feedstock, which are regionally very different, which are regionally available in different forms and different quantities. That makes a choice for the SAF, because technologies are available today. If you look, there are seven or eight pathways, rather to be precise, nine pathways today, which are ASTM qualified pathways. And you talked about harmonization in the mornings, so they are all ASTM approved pathways, right? So. Airlines accept that. So you have technologies, so then why SAF is still not coming up? Mm. The fundamental barrier there is availability of that feedstock. Availability of feedstock is there, but then the robust resilient supply chain to make that feedstock available at scale is something which is right now missing in different geographies. That's why if you see globally, there are hardly three or four SAF plants today, and every nation is making announcements. So probably what <coughs> we need is uh, policies which are not just technology neutral, but policies which are also looking at how you create those robust feedstocks. And one, I think, closing point which I will uh, like to uh, share on your question is waste-based feedstocks, because genesis of uh, uh, SAF is sustainability. When you take waste-based feedstock, like we provide a technology solution which is end-to-end -end conversion of waste carbon to ethanol, and then ethanol is a feedstock for production of SAF. So probably that kind of you know, blend of technology and feedstock need to come together. Alcohol to jet, you yes. see you're pinning your futures on that. Yes. We also have synthetic fuels, Paddy, and I think this is an area you're probably quite keen to talk about. Yeah, I mean, the very exciting things about, uh, thing about synthetic fuels is that the feedstock is simply air and water around us. So uh, there are no imports whatsoever. So we, we turn air and water into fuel just by the addition of renewable energy. So um, that allows you to put a plant anywhere you like. And actually, ideally, you're going to put it very close to cheap and surplus generation of energy. And that makes the equation uh, very, very healthy for mass production. You're at the early stages. How much more expensive is synthetic fuel right now versus kerosene? So I think uh, uh, our first production plant, which we can build within two years from now, we put a price point somewhere uh, just above where the Biosaf is today, uh, which is typically 3x or 4x on fossil fuel. Um, but the, the, again, another exciting point is about synthetic fuels. Because the cost is all in the machine, the feedstock is effectively free, air and water. The cost is in the machine. As we know, any machines in the history of, of industry get cheaper every year as we make them better and more efficient. So this is another exciting point about synthetics, not only that we can scale uh, to, to any scale we need. All fossil fuel today could be made synthetically, but also that we can bring the cost down progressively year on year. So we've seen that in wind and solar energy, for instance, uh, dramatic cost reductions in, in the cost of those energies. Um, with synthetic fuel, from our own modeling, we predict that we can make fuel at cost parity with fossil fuel within 10 years. So that will be a real game chamber, changer. I mean, that would be a game changer. I know there is increasing skepticism that it'll ever be affordable enough. Jonathan, pick up on that, on the affordability issue, because I know you believe technology is the solution here. 
Well, I think Preeti's comments earlier about feedstock are really important for, for, for many to understand. If you look at the cost of sustainable aviation fuel today, first generation energy crops and second generation fats, oils and greases, some people might be shocked to understand that the processing cost component of those feedstocks is relatively small, circa $200 US a tonne. Notably, obviously, they don't sell for that price. But feedstocks, as the ones Preeti's talked about, um, are priced above the price of Jet A1. So if Jet A1 is priced at seven to 680 to 700 US a tonne today, used cooking oil, tallow, some of the energy crops, they're pricing well above that. So the focus on not only availability and nature, climate, and community impact around these feedstocks is not just about all those really important ESG issues. It's about the volume of the, of the feedstock that you're trying to source to potentially unlock and achieve that 60%. But it's also that if we target the waste feedstocks or CO2 in the atmosphere, which it is free still, apparently, unless somebody claims it, um, those waste feedstocks are negative. They are damaging the climate. They are damaging water, soil. They are putting E. coli bacteria into rivers. So to Preeti's point, and or, you know, to the point made earlier, those technologies that can unlock feedstocks that are cheap, climate, nature, and community positive, they are the game changer. And for all the skepticism yesterday on we're never going to get there, sure, you're not going to get there if you rely on fats, oils, and greases. And if, as a sustainable community, and I think we're doing this for our kids, I don't know what you guys are doing, but I'm doing it for my kids. If, if we're simply going to add to an industry the agricultural sector where land use change alone is 20% of greenhouse gas emissions, and Fatih mentioned aviation's too, uh, I think we're kidding ourselves. So I think technology that unlocks feedstocks is the equation. And then we have policy, and one of the biggest developments since we were all together last year at Doha, I think, has been policy, particularly in the United States. Lawrence, run us through the IRA and what it has done for this part of the sector. Yeah, so the Inflation Reduction Act uh, was passed uh, late last year and it really provides three big uh, incentives to increase the production of sustainable aviation fuels in the U.S. With, and we have an ultimate goal of being able to incentivize 3 billion gallons of SAF by 2030 with an ultimate goal of 35 billion by 2050. Realize it's 2023 right now and 2030 is just around a quarter, so we have a lot of work that we need to do. So included within the Inflation Reduction Act or the IRA, um, there is a when there's tax credit for years 23 and 24 that really uh, pushes the incentives for fuel producers to increase production of SAF. Also included in the IRA for years 25 through 27, there's a clean fuel production credit. So it's not specific to SAF, but still SAF is, is premium. In addition, the FAA uh, received about $300 million in additional grant monies that we will be able to hopefully distribute within the next year. Once again, fuel producers, airports, community organizations, for-profit organizations will be able uh, to work on projects that help with the storage, the transportation, the blending of SAF, which we think is critical as well as looking at different technologies that we can use um, to help us in our journey. Because, as you mentioned, in order to reach our net zero goals by 2050, SAF is a major part of the U.S. strategy. 65% of the emissions reduction. Absolutely. Before we ask uh, the SAF producers here how they feel about this policy, um, Jonathan, I know that you were talking to me about investment in the US and how you feel there's a degree of fragmentation despite the strides that have been made with the IRA. So uh, I'd, I'd like to respond to that, but I just one point about policy that I want to make, uh, that I want to make. If you use an oil and gas analogy, apologies to those who might have offense with that, Mandates and policies are like the pressurization of a pipeline. And we all know if you put a huge amount of pressure into a pipeline, and by the way, the airlines are at the end of the pipeline waiting for somebody to flow through it, 
<laughs> but you don't provide the incentives, which are the, the capacity, the bandwidth, and the diameter of the pipeline, you end up with abject failure. And so the point is you've got to have the yin and the yang. You've got to have the, the mandates, but you've got to have the incentives. Carrots and sticks. Carrots and sticks, yeah. I mean, that's, <laughs> yeah. I, I like the pipeline analogy. Yeah. Fluid mechanics, for those of you who did that. But the point I'm getting at is Europe and America are, it's fascinating. Europe is all about penalties, and America is about incentives. There isn't arbitrage between the two, because if you look at the effective price of SAF, even though they have fundamentally different ways of getting there, you don't see a very big difference in, in the effective price. But the thing about the United States, to come to the point, is you've got California and you've got various states, I think Illinois and others, that are putting in place new policies around low carbon fuel standards. Then you've got Blender's tax credits. Uh, then you've got the RFS with your RINs. So it's a very complex set of calculus that you've got to do to actually work out. And because it's not unified, and now on top of that, we've got the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, for most of the companies that, and I'm building projects, like I'm a banker, but we build projects. Most of the, the companies we talk to do not understand how it works. They do not understand how it's valued. And as a result, even airlines, when they have to pay a price for SAF, don't actually know what they're paying for. So I think what it, what it, what it really means, I, I think logically, is that we've got to get more standardization across the mm. globe in terms of the sustainability of the feedstocks, how the carbon intensity calculations are worked, um, what are the tax benefits, can they be cross-border? And then the last point I, I'd simply make is, I think it's really, really important for us to get there, that we've got to be able to tier the fuel that's produced. Is it low carbon, is it renewable, or is it sustainable? And the price shouldn't be the same. And governments and incentives and policies should hopefully reinforce that. Paddy, what do you think is going to work best? Sticks, carrots, a blend of the two. What do you think about the European sort of Green Deal and the Refuel EU initiative, which is a yeah, lot? Yeah, I mean, it, it may not be popular in the room that we like the Refuel EU. That surprises yeah. me. So I don't hear that no, a lot. For, you know, for a producer, which we are, you know, that's a great platform. It gives great uh, price support, particularly through the penalty regime, uh, which will allow us to start doing business. Um, but actually, the real challenge is not around the, the, the revenue side. It's really the capitalization of this industry that's the imperative. You know, that, that's the hurdle we've got to get over to get going with production. It's not about making fuel and selling fuel. It's about making the machine that makes the fuel. And that's where we need capital. Um, and, and actually, just to give you a calibration for that, the cost of a fuel plant that would make synthetic fuel is roughly the cost of the aircraft that it would supply. So in a hundred million dollar aircraft, you need roughly a hundred million dollar plant, and that would supply fuel for the life of the aircraft. So if we say at the moment there's about three trillion dollar uh, capital base out there in aircraft, we have a three trillion challenge, or I would call it maybe opportunity, to change the world. And you know, that's a really bright future, by the way, because we get to a stage where we have cost parity or even lower than fossil fuel, uh, stability, you know, make it in your own nation, you know, all sorts of problems go away. So it's a very exciting future there. And we're certainly going to get on to who should be helping to pay for all of that infrastructure. And <laughs> that is a big challenge. But first, pretty, what about emerging markets <coughs> in India? From your experience, what policies are working, what's not working, and should there somehow be some, I mean, I hate to say a harmonized policy, I, I don't believe it'll ever happen. Yeah, no, thanks for that question. Uh, in India, I had the you know opportunity to work with the various committees who were looking into sustainable emission fuel. In fact, in the audience, we also have my you know fellow colleagues who were part of the committee, SAF task force, which government was constituted. And I must say, uh, the policies, when, I, when it comes to biofuel ecosystem in India and when it comes to policies, I must say they are very progressive and forward-looking policies. When I look at the biofuel policy per se, the biofuel policy in India includes all the possible waste sustainable feedstocks, which is the fundamental building block, as all of us are saying. So what is still missing there? What comes next? 
I think next come is you have these feedstock identified and the committee also identified there are two technology pathways, you know, which are more suitable because feedstock decides your choice of the technology. Now you need to bring investments. So these technologies are new. So when these technologies are new, the capex is, these are capital, capital intensive technologies for at least. So for the first of a kind plant, we need more financial incentives and stimulation from the policymakers or the stakeholders who are there in the ecosystem, they need to come together. And not just financial support, but also the long-term offtake. Once you have from the supply side, you put everything in place. On the demand side, if my plant is ready and I'm producing fuel after four years, where I need to sell that product. So you need to work supply and demand side policies in tandem. That's something uh, in India, I would say at supply side, we are already doing and airlines are there who are there to, you know, part of this discussion, I must say. The other point I would like to add in this uh, whole scenario is, we should not forget that, you know, anything which, you know, was successful in the renewable sector, we were hearing about renewable solar, renewable power. At the end of the day, for any technology, you need to bring in socioeconomic benefits. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to SAF, it is very important that we bring that socioeconomic benefit that can come from the waste-based supply chain, because at the end of the value chain, there are a farmer community. There are people who are in the aggregation of those supply chains. So you are not just serving this, you know, uh, sector, which is still thought to be a premium sector aviation. You are connecting with the socioeconomic impact that growing to the spectrum of the, you know, uh, people across uh, in the aviation, in the agri sector or in the uh, supply chain. So that is very important building block. And uh, again, policy is very central for all these things to create a snowball effect. Then I think we can see a ramp up in the SAF production capacity. And that's a really interesting point, making governments realize that there is a socio-economic interest there far beyond just hitting certain emissions targets. Okay, let's move on to the money because all of this, if it's to succeed, is gonna be insanely expensive. I mean, the investment needed, I've read, in terms of an estimate, in terms of infrastructure, is up to 1.5 trillion dollars for 2050. Who should shoulder that? Is it the fuel suppliers and the airlines? Is it other stakeholders? Who wants to take it? I'm happy to have a go. So I think we started, the, the, we, we were here talking about SAF enablement. So let's focus on the S of SAF. I think no airline or nobody in, in the community wants this industry to, to come up with a solution that's not gonna have that sustainable impact. So to what Pree's talked about, talked about feedstocks and communities. So when it comes to finance, I think what happens is we've got to look at ways of unlocking risk capital where the technologies that produce SAF will enable the processing of those feedstocks. Right now, we don't quite have that. Yes, there are some technologies, Fisher Trope, alcohol to jet, um, that are doing that. But there are other amazing technologies. I can say I'm, I'm working I have a partner in the room, Qantas, we're in joint venture together, a bank, an airline, and a, and a major energy company in Japan. We are working on new technologies that will, will introduce regenerative feedstocks to produce those SAF uh, products. But the point is that risk capital, that early risk capital is a small fraction of what the at-risk cash flows are for the aviation sector. So to my mind, it's a combination of those who are at risk putting that capital in. It is banks who are going to have to report under the TCFD and the TNFD. We have to put <coughs> the capital in. So I'm an equity holder in that joint venture. And it's also going to have to be governments because we need governments to provide guarantees when we get to the point where we are, we're doing project and structured finance. And the reason why I raise that is because a company of your, your company's size, is not an investment grade company. It can't raise corporate debt. It needs project and structured finance, which means it needs friends. It needs to form an incorporated joint venture where it's got strong credit counterparts. They could be airlines. They could be pension funds. But the point being, you need project and structured finance, and that often requires people to guarantee pre-completion construction phases, and that's where, for example, 
industries, government, and others can provide guarantees against that debt in the construction phase. So to that end, project finance enables a lot more players to come into the market. If you're the big players, of course, you use corporate debt. You don't, you don't need project finance, but not everybody can, can actually fund their solutions that way. I mean, you know, um, obviously, um, I know you're not LanzaJet, but LanzaJet is an incorporated joint venture involving a variety of shareholders, all of them are investment grade. But there are others that we are working on where our counterparts are not investment grade, and their IP is absolutely invaluable. So finance, risk capital, project finance, guarantees, export credit agencies, uh, they are going to be critical to unlocking this supply chain. If I can add to that, ultimately, governments are not in the business of producing, buying, or selling staff. What we have a responsibility to do is, is ensure that the conditions are right for the market to work, right? So within the U.S., one of the things that we're working on is trying to manage the risk for investors to make the necessary investments to both improve economically as well as the environmental benefits of SAF. And what works in the U.S. may not work here in Turkey or may not work in Europe. And that's why multilateral organizations like ICAO will be incredibly important to the point that Jonathan made early in terms of standardization and harmonizing standards around the globe. We will need ICAO to continue stepping up and leading in the way that they have been. Last year's assembly with the adoption of the LTAG as well as strengthening Corsia was a step in the right direction. Later this year, with respect to CAP3, ICAO member states have another opportunity to hone in building the progress of last year and specifically lay out how states and ICAO can work together to achieve our, our, our goals for 2050. Paddy, from your perspective as the startup, how challenging is it to raise the capital you need and what would you like to see to make this process easier? Well, I think as Jonathan says, you know, there's a lot of risk aversion out there in general. And that is a problem for startups, particularly with new technology. So there is that hurdle to prove the point, and you've got to prove the point at scale. Um, it becomes a lot easier from then on. So, you know, the first plant we build, we call first of a kind. After that, you know, you can get a lot more going with debt finance. So the, it's necessary to bootstrap this industry. Um, but I see it in more positive terms. It's a very exciting opportunity really because the airline sector has had a really bad time you know it gets all the attention around carbon emissions really quite unfairly relative to the scale of of those emissions synthetic fuels are needed in all sectors pretty much the only one where they they may not apply is personal transport road cars which can be electrified uh, <coughs> although there are other challenges with that but pick any other sector, uh, you know, marine, agriculture, you name it, we need liquid fuels. It's just not getting quite the same attention that flight, so we have flight shame, but the, the, there's not so many other shames elsewhere. So I think the industry could turn that, op you know, that, that problem into a fantastic story because the aviation industry can be the pioneers of turning the world synthetic and, and all that needs is to bootstrap this sector, bootstrap the synthetic fuel industry uh, just in the next, you know, three, four, five years and we'll be going. So, uh, I, you know, I see the positive in that. We, we even, you know, we, we present ourselves as zero with that positive impression. We're all about, you know, uh, carrying on doing the things that we all need to, that we all enjoy doing, but doing them right. And you know, it, it's not about ticking boxes and doing our duty. It's actually about just moving forwards with the world in, in the right way. And it's all, it's all very, very possible. In the last couple of years, there have been several book and claim schemes and initiatives launched to try and broaden out investment and stakeholders. Pretty, what do you think about the book and claim system? Is it working? Is it attracting enough corporate investment? So. Uh, what I can, you know, understand the way different corporates have committed. Yes, uh, some of the corporates in U.S. and Europe have already looking into book and claim kind of value. It provides more flexibility 
to the airlines and other stakeholders in the mix to use the SAF, you know, and then claim those benefits. And I would say that is very important when it comes to the overall ecosystem also. You have technology, you have financial support, but then the corporates are also coming forward. So those kind of mechanisms are really important, but still I would say uh, the awareness and right understanding about that topic is still required because there is only a very you know, limited set of stakeholders I have seen when I am engaged with them who understand this comprehensively. So we need to create more awareness around that topic. SAF itself, if you ask me, I keep on meeting so many different people across the industry and outside industry. SAF itself is a still a topic which industry is still trying to absorb, understand what it is all about. So we need to create more awareness also about the, around the topic. When we consider carbon accounting for corporates, yeah. is it simple enough yet with SAF? Is there a globally recognized certification system? There is. Well, <coughs> it's a really good point. Um, as I'm sure you know, with, with carbon credits, there's been a lot of debate about the authenticity, right? And it's, it's very much, and in Australia, we've had the same thing. And whether it's, um, and in the process of certifying and assessing, the, the, the SAF industry is incredible. I mean, the U United States have got the GREET model. Most people in the industry don't know what GREET is. They think it's something you do when you shake hands, but it, it isn't quite that. In fact, it does lead to a really good handshake when you get a lovely premium for your fuel based on its carbon intensity. So I think the thing is that GREET is very, very prescriptive. Everything from every little aspect of activity in the feedstock, the transport, the energy inputs into the facilities. And, you know, this isn't, once again, I'm, I'm a third generation junkie, so don't, I'm not going to uh, be shy about it. But if you look at third generation feedstocks and you look at GREET, your feedstocks start at negative scores. So if fossil is 85 grams of CO2 per megajoule. If I'm using animal waste, human waste, effluent, um, slaughtery, uh, you know, abattoir waste, I'm starting at minus 100 or minus 200 grams of, uh, of carbon per megajoule, a uh, CO2 per megajoule. So I think that model is exceptional because you can, you can embed it into your financial models. You can, you can you put your project technologies, you can look at all your inputs. The problem is we don't get transparency. And so in some regards, the world needs a single standard and we need certification. And if you are the airline at the end of the pipeline that hopefully hasn't been overpressurized and exploded, um, you need to know that that SAF that you just bought under that certification, right, maybe even a blockchain system that goes right back to where that crop came from or that waste came from, is incredibly clear. And I think that is going to be an enabler. It's also going to affect, I think, more capital going in because people have to understand climate is not separate from nature. And it's, going, it's, 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 it's pervasive, the, the narrative is there. But SAF can deal with cleaning up the climate. If the climate and cleaning up the climate under GREET gives you big negative scores, the value of your fuel goes up. And that waste is a liability. It's, it's causing havoc. Um, not in areas where people drive EVs, by the way. In areas of the world where 62% of the population where we are to the north are living in filth. So I think the model and, and, and a certifiable transparent and, w and essentially a single model is going to be vital. And it's but a single model, everybody. and who, who leads that, Lawrence? ICAO? Um, if ICAO can move quickly enough, right? So <laughs> that's the issue. Um, but but, but, but to, to, to Jonathan's point, in terms of whatever the model is, it needs to be transparent, it needs to be easily understood, and it needs uh, to be able to be incorporated into the financing models that investors need to make. Yeah. Now, the one voice we don't have on stage right now are the airlines, but they're out here in the audience. <laughs> what role do airlines have here? Ready? Yeah, I think uh, it's a tremendous opportunity for airlines out there. One, yes, long-term offtake when it comes to airlines commitment is very important, but it's also a way to look at the market from a futuristic point of view, <coughs> that you be a part of this journey, you help to build that ecosystem so that, you know, as we heard, that government can only support your system at the initial stage. 
but how you can have that you know, industry to be created in the long run. And if you use waste, that can be distributed system of production. Imagine you know, that beautiful distributed system of production producing SAF. Airlines can be a party to this. And some of this, you know, one point I would like to mention because we heard in the previous presentation, some of these, you know, technology choices when we make, we have to be cognizant of the fact that some of the technology pathways are very important when it comes to uh, environmental benefits. For example, we heard about, you know, contrails. So if the SAF technology is giving you class of SPKs, which is, sorry, I'm chemistry background, which is class of synthetic paraffinic kerosenes, when you have SAF with those kind of properties, it can help to you reduce 95% of contrails, like in our pathway as well. So you need to have all those, you know, uh, factors and important parameters in place, and airlines can be a part of that process when this kind of discussion is happening. Hadi, what would you like to see from airlines? I would like to see some of the support that I talked about earlier for transforming the sector. I mean, you know, we've been saying for a long time, but you know, now more and more are saying it, we feel the EU endorses it. Synthetic fuel is the only future for scale. It's as simple as that. You know, we can talk all day about other feedstocks, but they will play their part. Some of them a great part because we're using waste. But the game for, for scale to replace all fossil fuels is synthetic. And I would like to see the airlines uh, you know, supporting that, embracing that, uh, taking a structural role in the creation of that industry. Um, because whilst that is a challenge at the moment, short term, it's new tech, people, you know, not really sure, um, the future is very, very bright. Uh, and, and, and it will lead to a, a world where fuel is, is cheaper, I believe, stable in price, uh, you know, a much better world than the one we live in today, quite apart from the fossil carbon emissions. The target we have for this sector is hugely ambitious. And yesterday, speaking on CNN, the CEO of Qatar Airways says he doesn't believe that the target can be reached either by 2030 or 2050. How do you all feel about that? He doesn't believe the feedstock is there. Quick fire round, Jonathan. If your technologies do not access feedstocks that are abundant, that are destroying the planet, have a negative value, or, in your case, free, then I correct. I don't think you're going to get there. But if you have the technologies that can access those feedstocks, one of the projects we're looking at in Southeast Asia, the waste in that region is 160 million tons a year. I can produce the best jet fuel out of that stuff at a negative carbon intensity score. So to my mind, technology, capital, and new pathways and new feedstocks, and I reckon you've got a chance of getting there and generating carbon credits, which Willie over there will probably consider our course here eligible. Patty? Well, we heard the CEOs address that question yesterday. If you don't set a challenge, you'll definitely never get there. I have a background in Formula One. I was 32 years in that industry. We set ourselves a lot of very serious challenges in that space. Um, there was one year we were back of the grid and we set the challenge to win the race within half a season from the back and we did it. Um, you know, that, that was an incredible and seemingly impossible achievement. So I, I, I come from a position of great optimism. You've got to set the, set the goal and go and do it. And it's absolutely achievable. There's no fundamental reason why it can't be done, by the way. You know, the, the feedstock is just around us. It's about building machinery. That's about capital. That's about confidence. And that's about optimism. So, uh, you know, as I said earlier, I think this is a sector can, that can lead that charge. Lawrence, final yeah. words. Policies we've put in place in the US uh, and, and the incentives we've put in place have been both technology <laughs> and feedstock neutral. We want to continue that work. We want to see how the policies we've instituted now will work in the next couple of years. There's great ambition that we see across the sector from governments, from industry. I think that's important. Ambition is good. Action is better. We're putting action for it and, and look forward to working with partners to make it happen. Do we reach this goal? So I would answer your question in a different way. It's a thumb rule when you play on your, your you know, uh, your strengths, you're going to win. So the strength in the SAF ecosystem is abundant, available, low-cost feedstock. 
once you have that feedstock, you have different technologies. The only thing you need is bring them together with the right policy instruments, and then success can be stepwise built into the system. Thanks to IATA for bringing so many voices together on this. That is all we have time for. Thank you very much, everyone. That was excellent.